That is a scary looking picture. Barbara Von Beck at age 27 in the year 1813. We're just not used to seeing a woman with so much hair. But why does she have so much hair? It turns out to be an endocrine imbalance. This means that she had an abnormal hormonal condition. And in her case, the condition involved androgens. These are male hormones that are required for male characteristics like muscle strength, hair growth, and the deepening of the male voice, except that Barbara was a woman. So she had an endocrine condition where she was either too sensitive to these hormones or she had abnormally high levels of androgens. And the result was a condition known as hirsutism or excessive hairiness. So today we're going to talk about how molecules such as androgens work. And androgens are a type of hormone. And so this leads us into our first discussion of the endocrine system. And so first of all, we're going to start by getting an overview of what the endocrine system is all about. It is one of the 11 organ systems of the body. And it consists of glands and the hormones they secrete. So what do we mean when we're talking about glands and hormones? Well, a gland is a cell, and a cell that is a gland will secrete a molecule called a hormone, which is defined as a molecule that is secreted into the bloodstream. And the molecule travels in the bloodstream to the target cell for that hormone. And at the target cell, it carries out or initiates uh, a series of reactions on the part of the target cell to some sort of changing conditions in the body. And so by the hormones actions on the target cell, it maintains homeostasis. Okay, and so homeostasis is the maintenance of a steady state in the body, maintenance of a stable state. The other organ system that is responsible for this is the nervous system. So here I'm drawing a neuron. And the thing about a neuron is that a neuron also um, secretes a chemical messenger. Now, a hormone is a type of chemical messenger, but in the case of neurons, the chemical messenger is a neurotransmitter. And neurotransmitters only go between two cells. So in this case, we're drawing another neuron, and the synapse is between the two cells. So this is the nervous system, but the endocrine system involves hormones moving through the entire bloodstream, going to a target cell, uh, binding to a receptor on the target cell, and initiating a series of reactions within that target cell. So let's take a look at the various endocrine glands of the body have to realize is that some endocrine glands contain only endocrine cells and they don't contain cells that do anything but secrete hormones. Okay, these will be the pituitary, pituitary gland which is in the brain, the pineal gland which is also in the brain, the thyroid gland which is in the neck, and the parathyroid gland, which is just posterior to the thyroid, also in the neck, and the adrenal glands, which are superior to the kidneys. But then there are other endocrine glands, and these endocrine glands are also doing a function that is part of another organ system. Okay, so in this case, let's make a list of these. Also part of another system. And so, for example, the pancreas, and the pancreas is part, uh, also part of the digestive system, but also is involved in regulation of blood sugar. And the thymus, which is also uh, part of the body's immune system, um, but secretes uh, hormones that um, are responsible for the development of white blood cells. There's the thymus. And the gonads, such as the ovaries and the testes, which are also part of the reproductive system. 
And then there's the hypothalamus in the brain, which is part of the nervous system, but sends hormones in response to nerve impulses. So let's just write hypothalamus in here at the top of the slide uh, in, this, in the brain. Then there's a third class of endocrine glands, which are really just clusters of cells inside organs whose primary function is to do other things like the kidney, for example, whose primary function is uh, filtering the blood, and or the heart, which primary function is to pump blood, but it also secretes a hormone called atrionatriuretic peptide. And then there is the skin, which has the function of protecting the body, and but also uh, makes a uh, vitamin D precursor uh, in the presence of sunlight. And then you have the digestive tract, which is responsible for digestion, but also makes hormones that are helpful to the digestive process. So all of these endocrine glands secrete two types of hormones. One type is called the amino acid-based hormone. And here is a picture of an amino acid is a polar molecule, and the other type of hormone is the steroid hormone, which are derivatives of cholesterol, and these are nonpolar lipids. These are categories of hormones. The amino acid-based hormones may be monolin, or they may be short proteins called peptides, like oxytocin, which is only nine amino acids long, or they could be long proteins, like growth hormone, which is 191 amino acids long. And then the steroid hormones are, for example, the sex hormones, estrogen and testosterone, produced by ovaries and testes, or stress-related hormones like cortisol, produced by the adrenal glands. And but whether the hormones fall into the polar category or into the nonpolar category determines their mechanism of secretion by their glandular cell. So let's take a look at how that works. So in the case of polar hormones, they are going to be uh, secreted by the cell. So here's a cell nucleus and here is the endoplasmic reticulum. And on the endoplasmic reticulum, I am putting ribosomes and making it the rough endoplasmic reticulum. This is where protein type hormones will be made. And so the ribosomes are making the proteins and then they travel in vesicles to the Golgi bodies. And then the Golgi, Golgi bodies package the hormone and through exocytosis, send the hormone out of the cell. And, but the nonpolar hormones are going to be sent out of the cell in a different sort of way. So the polar hormones have to go out by exocytosis, but the nonpolar hormones, they're uh, lipid-like, and therefore they uh, can dissolve in the plasma membrane. And so first of all, they are synthesized in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So here's my attempt to draw the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And then the hormones travel out of the cell through diffusion through the cell membrane. And so these are two different types of secretion. So the hormones are going to be secreted by their glands and then they are going to travel through the bloodstream to their target cells. And whether a hormone is polar or nonpolar determines its mechanism of action at the target cell. So let's first take a look at the action of a polar or amino acid based hormone. So because the hormone is polar, when it arrives at its target cell, it can't diffuse through the cell membrane. It must bind to a receptor, which is located on the cell surface. The binding of a hormone to its receptor is kind of like a key going into a lock. Each hormone has its own specific receptor. And so the binding of the hormone to the receptor on the surface of the cell is then going to trigger 
chemical reaction A going to B in this hypothetical case on the inside of the cell. So we often call the uh, hormone, a polar hormone, the first messenger, and it cannot get into the cell, but the uh, creates a second messenger inside the cell, which can then carry out the cell's reaction to the situation. Okay, now in the case of a nonpolar hormone, the action at the target cell is going to be different. So let's take a look at that. Nonpolar or steroid based hormone is lipid like. And remember the old chemistry ditty that like dissolves in like. So when the nonpolar hormone arrives at the target cell, it likes the lipid bilayer and can diffuse right through the cell membrane and bind to its receptor, which is located inside the cell. And then the hormone receptor complex triggers a series of reactions, hypothetically drawn out as A becoming B. The overall purpose of a hormone is to maintain homeostasis. A hormone, therefore, is a chemical messenger that allows a cell to maintain stability, maintain your blood pressure, your blood sugar, or prevent dehydration, for example. That means that when the level of X, for example, becomes lower than its set point, this level is detected by a sensor which provides information to an integrating center. The integrating center is often the brain. It interprets the information and sends the message to an effector. The effector accomplishes the task, causes the level of X to rise again to its set point. And now that X is back to normal, it shuts off the action of the sensor. This shutoff is called negative feedback. Let's look at an example of negative feedback in the body. If a person becomes dehydrated, the sensors are osmoreceptors in the hypect a higher solute concentration in the blood and they shrink. This sends a message to the hypothalamus and ultimately the pituitary, which would be the integrating centers, to send out antidiuretic hormone or ADH to the kidney. The kidney is the effector which prevents urination of excessive water. Water is then restored to the blood and the osmoreceptor will stop sending impulses to the hypothalamus. There's some circumstances where hormones can trigger the opposite of homeostasis, which is to create a positive feedback situation. So let's look at the feedback situation. The rising level of X is detected by a sensor which contacts the integrating center, which triggers the effector to raise the level of X even more. Raising levels of X then trigger the sensor once again until more and more X takes place. The situation is sometimes necessary in the body, such as in blood clotting reactions or during labor. During labor, uterine stretch receptors are going to trigger sensory neurons to stimulate the hypothalamus and pituitary to send out the hormone oxytocin. Oxytocin triggers uterine muscle contractions, which act by positive feedback to trigger the release of even more oxytocin. Positive feedback does not lead to homeostasis, and ultimately the baby is born, and this shuts off the system. Not all glands are stimulated by the brain to secrete a hormone. There are actually three ways that glands can be stimulated. The first is humoral stimulation. Humoral means fluid. The pancreas detects an increase in blood sugar directly and sends out insulin to lower blood sugar levels. Secondly, there is neural stimulation of a gland. The sympathetic nervous system can activate the adrenal gland in a fight or flight situation to send out the hormones epinephrine and norepinephrine. 
The third way that glands are stimulated is hormonal. For example, the hypothalamus will send out releasing hormones to the pituitary, and then the pituitary sends out stimulating hormones, for example, to a gland such as the thyroid gland, and then the thyroid gland, which um, is involved in the control of the metabolism, will send out the hormone thyroxin. We'll learn more about specific hormones in upcoming lectures. Thank you for listening.